The Mind's Psalter by Jean Ray. A man who is about to die is not likely to be very elegant in his last words. Being in a hurry to sum up his whole life, he tends to make them rigorously concise. But it was different with Ballister, as he lay dying in the forecastle of the trawler, North Caper, from Grimsby. He had tried in vain to stop the flow of blood that was draining his life away. He had no fever. His speech was steady and rapid. He did not seem to see the bandages or the bloody basin. His eyes were following remote and formidable images. Rains, the radio man, was taking notes. Rains spends all his spare time writing stories and essays for short-lived literary magazines. As soon as one of them is born in Paternoster Row, his name is sure to appear on the list of contributors. Do not be surprised, therefore, by the rather special style given to this final monologue of a mortally wounded sailor. The blame must fall on Reigns, the literary man without glory, who transcribed it. But I can testify that the facts it contains are the same as those reported before four members of the crew of the North Caper. Benjamin Corman, the captain. Yours truly, John Copeland, first mate. Ephraim Rose, engineer, and the aforementioned Archibald Rains. Thus spoke Ballister. It was in the Merry Heart Tavern that I first met the schoolmaster, and it was there that we struck our bargain and he gave me his orders. The Merry Heart is more of a meeting place for bargemen than for sailors. Its dilapidated façade is reflected in the water of one of Liverpool's back docks, where barges from the inland waterways are moored. I looked at the well-drawn plan of a small schooner. She's almost a yacht, I said. In heavy weather, she must be able to sail close to the wind, and that broad stern will make it possible for us to manoeuvre well when there's a wind. There's an auxiliary engine, too. He said. I frowned, having always loved sailing. Built by Hallets and Hallets, Glasgow, 1909, I said. She's very well rigged. With her sixty tons and a crew of six, she'll take to the sea better than a transatlantic liner. His face took on a look of satisfaction, and he ordered a round of expensive drinks. Why are you changing her name from the hen parrot? I asked. It's a nice name. I've always liked parrots. He hesitated slightly. It's a matter of... sentiment, or of gratitude, if you prefer. So the ship will be called the Mines Salter. It's odd, but I suppose it's original. Alcohol had made him a little loquacious. That's not the reason, he said. A year ago, a grand-uncle of mine died and left me a trunk full of old books. So, wait, I was looking through them without enthusiasm when one of them caught my attention. It was an incunabulum. A what? An incunabulum, he said with a slight air of superiority, is a book published shortly after the invention of the printing press. And I was amazed to recognise the almost heraldic mark of Fust and Schaefer. Those names probably mean nothing to you. Fust and Schaefer were partners of Gutenberg, the inventor of the printing press. The book I had in my hands was nothing less than a rare and splendid copy of the famous Mainz Psalter, published towards the end of the 15th century. I gave him a look of polite attention and false understanding. <laughs> What will impress you more, Mr. Ballister, he said, is that a mine's salter is worth a fortune. Ah, I said, suddenly interested. Yes, it's worth a fine bundle of banknotes, big enough to buy the former hen parrot and pay ample wages to a crew of six men for the cruise I want to make. 
Now do you understand why I want to give such an unmaritime name to our little ship? I understood it perfectly, and I congratulated him on his greatness of soul. And yet it would seem more logical to me, I said, to name the ship after that dear uncle who left you the book. He burst into loud, disagreeable laughter. <laughs> I was disconcerted by such coarseness on the part of an educated man. You leave from Glasgow, he said, and sail the ship through the North Minch to Cape Wrath. Those are hellish waters, I said. I chose you precisely because you know them, Mr. Ballister. No finer praise can be given a sailor than to say that he knows the horrible corridor of water that is the Minch Channel. My heart swelled with pride. That's true, I said. In fact, I was once nearly killed between Chicken and Tiumpen Head. South of Cape Wrath, he went on. There's a sheltered little bay that's known only to a few bold sailors by a name that doesn't appear on the map. Big Toe Bay. I looked at him in surprised admiration. Do you know Big Toe? I said. That's something that would make you respected by customs and would probably get you stabbed by certain men of the coast. He made a gesture of indifference. I'll rejoin the ship at Big Toe Bay. And from there, he indicated a precise westerly direction. Mm, that's a nasty place, I said, in a real desert of water strewn with sharp rocks. We won't see many trails of smoke on the horizon. You're quite right, he said. I winked at him, thinking I understood. As long as you pay the way you've said, I replied, I don't care what you do. I think you're mistaken about my plans, Mr. Ballister. They're of a rather scientific nature, but I don't want to have a discovery stolen from me by some envious rival. In any case, it doesn't matter, because I'll pay, as I said. We spent a few minutes drinking. Then, just as we were about to discuss the question of the crew, our conversation veered off, strangely. I'm not a sailor, he said, brusquely, so don't count on me to help with handling the ship. Let me be specific. I'm a schoolmaster. I respect learning, I said, and I'm not entirely lacking in it myself. Schoolmaster? Good, good. Yes, in Yorkshire. Let's go over the crew now, I said. First of all, there's Turnip. It's an odd name, but he's a good man and a good sailor. There's a prison term in his recent past. Is that a drawback? Not in the least. Good. You can have him for reasonable wages, especially if you take a little rum on board. It can be cheap rum. He's not particular about qualities, as long as the quantity is there. And then there's Stevens, a Fleming. He never talks, but he can break a mooring chain as easily as you can bite through the stem of a clay pipe. And I suppose he also has a prison term in his past. It's not unlikely. I'll take him. What did you say his name was again? Stavens. Stavens. Is he expensive? Not at all. He makes up for his low pay by eating vast amounts of bacon and biscuits. And current jam, if you buy any. We'll take half a ton of it on board, if you like. He'll be your slave. I might suggest Walker to you now. But he's very ugly. Are you joking? No. His face lacks half a nose, part of a chin, and a whole ear, so it's not pleasant to look at for someone who's not used to Madame Tussauds' Museum of Horrors, especially since the operation was sloppily performed by some Italian sailors who were in a bit of a hurry. And who else? Two excellent men, Jelwyn and Friar Tuck. Friar Tuck, I don't know him by any other name, is a cook, among other things. A sea-going jack-of-all-trades. He and Jelwyn are always together, 
If you see one, you see the other. And if you hire one, you must hire the other. They're rather mysterious. It's said that Jelwyn has royal blood in his veins. And that Friar Tuck is a devoted servant who has stayed with him in adversity. And their price is in keeping with their mystery. Precisely. The fallen prince must have driven a car in the past. So he'll be the one to take care of your auxiliary engine. It was then that an incident took place that has little bearing on the events of this story, but that I remember with a certain uneasiness. A poor devil had just been blown into the bar by the gusty night wind. He was a kind of emaciated, rain-soaked clown, faded by all the miseries of the sea and the waterfront. He ordered a glass of gin and greedily raised it to his lips. Suddenly I heard the sound of breaking glass, and saw the derelict throw up his hands, stare at the schoolmaster with unspeakable terror, then hurry outside into the wind and rain, without picking up his change from the bar. I don't think the schoolmaster noted the incident, or at least he didn't seem to, but I still dare not imagine the formidable reason that drove that poor wretch to drop his chin on the floor, abandon his money, and flee into the icy street when the bar was filled with exquisite warmth. On one of the first days of a very mild spring, the North Minch opened before us as though for a brotherly embrace. A few angry currents were still moving craftily beneath the surface, but we could detect them by our greenbacks, writhing like segments of mutilated snakes. One of those curious southeastern breezes that blow only in that region brought us the fragrance of the early Irish lilacs, 200 miles away, and helped the auxiliary engine to take us to Big Toe Bay. There, things changed radically. Whirlpools dug holes in the water, hissing like steam engines. We avoided them only with great difficulty, the moss-green hull of a sunken ship, raised from the depths of the Atlantic, shot up almost under the bobstay of our bowsprit, and was hurled against a rock wall, where it exploded in a dark burst of rotten wood. A dozen times the mine's salter was in danger of being dismasted, as though by a stroke of a giant razor. Fortunately, she was a beautiful sailor, and she lay to with the elegance of a true lady of the sea. A few hours of calm enabled us to run the engine at full speed and pass through the narrow channel of Victor Bay, just as another furious tide came thundering after us in a green spray of tormented water. We're in inhospitable waters, I said to my men. If the coastal scavengers find us here, we'll have to give them an explanation. And since they'll try to chase us away before hearing what we have to say, we'd better have our guns ready. The scavengers did put in an appearance. But in so doing, they met with a disaster that was as disturbing as it was incomprehensible to us. For a week, we had been lying at anchor in that little bay, which was as calm as a duck pond. Life was pleasant. Our supplies of food and drink were worthy of a royal yacht. By swimming twelve strokes or rowing seven times, we could reach little red sand beach, and further on, a stream of icy fresh water. Turnip caught halibut on a line. Stavens went inland to the deserted moors, and sometimes, if the wind was right, we could hear the boom of his shotgun. He brought back partridges, grouse, occasionally a big pawed hare, and always some of those delicious heath rabbits with fragrant flesh. The schoolmaster had not appeared. We did not worry. We had been paid in cash for six weeks in advance, and Turnip had said he would not leave until the last drop of rum was gone. One morning, this serenity was shattered. Stavens had just filled a keg with fresh water when a shrill sound vibrated above him, and a foot away from his face, a rock exploded into dust. He was a phlegmatic man. Without haste, he waded into the bay, 
spotted a puff of blue smoke rising from a cleft in a rock, ignored the angry little slaps that struck the surface of the water beside him, and calmly swam back to the ship. He went into the forecastle, where the crew was waking up, and said, Someone's shooting at us. His words were punctuated by three sharp blows against the hull. I took a rifle from the rack and went up on deck. I instinctively ducked at the sound of a whining bullet. An instant later, a handful of wooden splinters leapt into the air, and the bronze rolling gear of the boom clanged beneath the impact of a lead slug. I raised my rifle toward the cleft that Stavens pointed out to me. I saw billows of black powder smoke coming from it. But suddenly the shooting stopped and was replaced by vociferations and shouts of fear. Something struck the dark red beach with a heavy thud. I started in horror. A man had just fallen 300 feet from the top of the cliff. His broken body was almost entirely buried in the sand, but I was able to recognise the coarse leather clothing of the wreckers of Cape Wrath. I had scarcely turned my eyes away from that lifeless mass when Stavens touched me on the shoulder. Here comes another one, he said. An awkward, ridiculous shape was hurtling toward the ground. It was like the loose, ungainly fall of a big bird that has been hit by shotgun pellets at a great height and, conquered by gravity and betrayed by the air, comes tumbling down without dignity. For the second time there was a soft, ghastly thud on the sand. This time a villainous face quivered for a few seconds, spewing crimson froth. Staven slowly pointed to the top of the cliff. One more, he said, in a slightly faltering voice. Wild screams rang out from above. Suddenly we saw the bust of a man against the sky, struggling with something invisible. He made a desperate gesture, then flew from the cliff as though propelled by a catapult. His cry was still floating down to us in a slow tailspin of despair when his body was smashed beside the two others. We stood still. It's true they were trying to kill us, said Jelwyn, but I'd like to avenge those poor devils. Please give me your rifle, Mr. Ballister. Friar Tuck, come here. Friar Tuck's shaved head emerged from the depths of the ship. Friar Tuck is as good as a hunting dog, Jelwyn explained with a touch of condescension. Or rather, he's as good as a whole pack of them. He smells the quarry from very far off. He's phenomenal. And what do you think of this quarry, old boy? Friar Tuck hoisted his round, massive body onto the deck and waddled over to the rail. He scrutinised the mangled corpses and showed deep surprise. Then an ashen pallor came over his face. Friar, said Jelwyn with a nervous laugh, you've seen some strong sights in your day, yet you're turning pale like a young chambermaid. No, no, it's not that, Friar Tuck replied dully. There's something ugly behind this. There's... Shoot, your grace! He suddenly shouted. Up there! Hurry! Jelwyn turned on him furiously. I've warned you about calling me by that damn name. Friar Tuck made no reply. He shook his head, then murmured. Too late. It's gone. What's gone? I asked. Why? The thing that was watching us from the cliff, he said foolishly. What was it? He gave me a crafty look. I don't know. Anyway, it's gone. I did not pursue my questioning. Two loud whistles came from the top of the cliff, and a shadow moved against the patch of sky behind it. Jelwyn raised his rifle. I pushed it aside. Pay attention to what you're doing. Schoolmaster was coming down toward the beach from the cliff, following a path we had not noticed before. A beautiful cabin in the stern had been reserved for the schoolmaster, and the adjoining room had been made into a bedroom for me, with two bunks. 
As soon as he arrived on board, the schoolmaster shut himself up in his cabin and spent his time going through a pile of books. Once or twice a day he went topside, had the sextant brought to him, and carefully took the sun. We were sailing northwest. We're headed for Iceland, I said to Jelwyn. He attentively looked at a map and wrote down a figure. No, he said, we're headed for Greenland. Well, what's the difference? We had left Big Toe Bay on a clear morning, leaving the Ross Mountains to warm their humps in the rising sun behind us. That day we passed a ship from the Hebrides manned by a flat-faced crew whom we insulted lavishly. The inhabitants of the Hebrides have, in general, disagreeable flat faces. Toward evening we saw a ketch in full sail just above the horizon. Next day the sea was rising. To starboard we saw a Danish steamer fighting against the waves. She was surrounded by so much smoke that we could not read her name. And that was the last ship we saw. Although on the third day there were two trails of smoke to the south that Walker said were from a dispatch boat of the British Navy. Every evening the schoolmaster invited me to have a drink in his cabin. He himself did not drink. He was no longer the loquacious companion of the Merry Heart Tavern, but he was still a well-bred man, for he never left my glass empty, and while I drank he kept his eyes on his books. I must admit that I have few memories of those days. Life was monotonous, and yet the crew seemed apprehensive to me, perhaps because of an incident that occurred one evening. We were all seized with violent nausea at almost the same time, and Turnip shouted that we had been poisoned. I sternly ordered him to be silent. The nausea passed quickly, and a sudden shift of wind forced us to perform a strenuous manoeuvre that made us forget everything else. The sun had risen on the eighth day of our voyage. I found the crew with anxious, sullen faces. I was familiar with such faces. At sea they are not a good sign. They indicate an uneasy, gregarious and hostile feeling that groups men and makes them merge in a single fear or hatred. An evil force surrounds them and poisons the atmosphere of the ship. It was Jelwyn who spoke first. Mr. Ballister, we want to talk to you, and we want to talk to you as our friend and shipmate rather than as our captain. Ha! <laughs> That's a fine preamble, I said, laughing. We're being nice about it because you're our friend, said Walker, and his horrible, shapeless face twisted. Tell me what's on your mind, I said. Something's wrong, said Jelwyn, and the worst of it is that none of us can explain it. I cast a dark glance around me, then held out my hand to him. It's true, Jelwyn. I feel it the same as you do. The faces brightened. The men had found an ally in their captain. Look at the sea, Mr. Ballister. I've seen it too, I said, looking down. Yes, I had seen it. The water had taken on a strange appearance that I had never seen before in all my twenty years at sea. It had oddly coloured streaks and it sometimes bubbled suddenly and loudly. Unknown sounds, something like laughter, would burst from a rapidly approaching wave and make the men look around in alarm. Not one bird is following us anymore, said Friartog. It was true. Last night, he said, in his deep, slow voice, a little herd of rats that had been living in the storeroom, ran topside, and all jumped overboard at once. I never saw anything like it. Never, never. said the other sailors in a somber echo. I've sailed in these waters before, said Walker, and at about this same time of year too. The air ought to be full of scooter ducks, and schools of porpoises ought to be following us from morning till night. Do 
you see any? Did you look at the sky last night, Mr. Ballister? Jelwyn asked me softly. No, I admitted, and I must have blushed a little. I had drunk a great deal in the schoolmaster's silent company, and had not come up on deck, for I had been in the grip of a powerful intoxication that was still pressing my temples with a lingering headache. Where is that devil of a man taking us? asked Turnip. Devil, yes, said the taciturn Stavens. Everyone had had his say. I made a sudden decision. Jelwyn, I said, listen to me. Now I'm the captain, it's true. But I'm not ashamed to admit in front of everyone that you're the most intelligent man on board. And I also know that you're not an ordinary sailor. He smiled sorrowfully. You know more about this than the rest of us, don't you? I asked. No, he replied. But Fra Tuck is a rather curious phenomenon. As I've already told you, he senses certain things without being able to explain them. It's as though he had one more sense than the rest of us. A sense of danger. Speak, Fratak. I know very little. Almost nothing, said the low voice. I know only that something is around us. Something worse than anything else. Worse than death. We looked at each other in alarm. The schoolmaster, continued Frytok, seeming to choose his words with difficulty, is not alien to it. Jolwyn, I said, I don't have the courage myself, but I want you to go and tell him. Very well, he replied. He went below. We heard him knock on the door of the schoolmaster's cabin. Knock again and again, then finally open the door. Minutes of silence went by. Jelwyn came back up on deck. He was pale. He's not there, he said. Search the whole ship. There's no place where a man can hide for long. We searched the ship then, went topside one by one, looking at each other uneasily. The schoolmaster had vanished. At nightfall, Jelwyn motioned to me to come up on deck. When I was beside him, he pointed upward. I think I fell to my knees. The strange sky was arched above the roaring sea. The familiar constellations were no longer there. Unknown stars in new geometrical groupings were shining dimly in a frighteningly black sidereal abyss. Good God! I exclaimed. Where are we? Heavy clouds were rolling across the sky. That's better, Jelwyn said calmly. The others might have seen it and gone mad. You want to know where we are? How should I know? Let's turn back, Mr. Ballister. Even though it's useless in my opinion. I took my head between my hands. The compass has been inert for two days, I murmured. I know, said Jelwyn. Where are we? Where are we? Be calm, Mr. Ballister, he said, rather ironically. You're the captain, don't forget that. I don't know where we are. I might make a hypothesis, to use an erudite word that sometimes covers an imagination that's too daring. Even so, I replied, I'd rather hear stories of witches and demons than that demoralizing, I don't know. Well, probably on another plane of existence. You have some mathematical knowledge. It will help you to understand. Our three-dimensional world is probably lost to us. And I'll define this one as the world of the nth dimension, which is very vague. If by some inconceivable magic or some monstrous science we were transported to Mars or Jupiter, or even to Aldebaran, it wouldn't prevent us from seeing the same constellations we see from Earth. But the sun, a similarity, a coincidence of the infinite, a kind of equivalent star, perhaps. 
Anyway, these are only suppositions. Words. And since I believe we'll be permitted to die in this strange world, the same as in our own, I feel that we can remain calm. Die? I said. I'll defend myself. <laughs> Against whom? He asked, sarcastically. It's true that Fryan talked about things worse than death. If there's anyone's opinion that shouldn't be ignored in time of danger, it's his. I returned to what he called his hypothesis. What do you mean by the nth dimension? By the love of heaven, he said nervously. Don't give my idea such real importance. There's no proof that existence is possible outside of our three ordinary dimensions. Just as we've never discovered any two-dimensional beings from the world of surfaces or one-dimensional beings from the linear world, we must be indiscernible to beings if there are any who live in worlds having more dimensions than ours. I'm in no mood to give you a lesson in hypergeometry, Mr. Pallister. But I'm sure of one thing. There are spaces different from ours. The space we're aware of in our dreams, for example, which presents the past, the present, and perhaps the future on a single plane. And then there's the world of atoms and electrons, relative and immense spaces with mysterious kinds of life. He made a gesture of lassitude. What was that an enigmatic schoolmaster's purpose in bringing us to this devilish region? How? And especially why? Did he disappear? I suddenly clapped my hand to my forehead. I had just remembered Friar Took's expression of fear and that of the poor derelict in the Merry Heart Tavern. I related the incident to Jelwyn. He slowly nodded. I mustn't exaggerate Friar Tuck's clairvoyant powers, he said. When he first saw the schoolmaster, he said to me, that man makes me think of an unsealable wall behind which something immense and terrible is taking place. I didn't question him because it would have been useless. That was all he knew. His occult perceptions take the form of images, and he's incapable of analysing them. In this case, his apprehension goes back even further. As soon as he heard the name of our schooner, he seemed upset and said there was great malice behind it. How shall we sail? I asked, abandoning nearly all authority. We're on the starboard tack, he said. The wind seems very steady. Shall we heave too? Why, let's go on making headway. I don't see any sign of a storm, but I think we'd better reef our sails a little, just the same. Walker will take the helm to begin with, I said. All he'll have to do is watch for patches of white water. If we hit a submerged rock, it might be the best solution for all of us, said Jelwyn. I could not have agreed with him more. While a known danger strengthens a leader's authority, the unknown brings him closer to the level of his men. That evening the forecastle was deserted and everyone crowded into the narrow room that served as my cabin. Jelwyn gave us two demijohns of excellent rum from his personal provisions and we used it to make a gigantic bowl of punch. Turnit was soon in an amiable mood. He began an endless story about two cats, a young lady and a house in Ipswich, a story in which he had played a favourable part. Stevens had made some fantastic sandwiches of hardtack and corned beef. Heavy tobacco smoke made a dense fog around the kerosene lamp, hanging motionlessly from its jimbles. The atmosphere was pleasant and friendly. With the help of the punch, I was on the verge of smiling at the fairy tales Jelwyn had told me earlier. Walker took his share of warm punch in a thermos bottle, picked up a lighted lantern, bade us good night and went up to take the helm. My clock slowly struck nine. An accentuated movement of the ship told us that the sea was growing rougher. We don't have much sail set, said Jelwyn. I silently nodded. Turnip's voice droned on, addressed to Stevens, 
who listened as he ground hardtack between the admirable millstones of his teeth. I emptied my glass and handed it to Fry Tuck to fill. Then I saw the wild expression on his face. His hand was squeezing Jelwit's, and they both seemed to be listening to something. What? I began. Just then, we heard loud imprecations overhead, followed by the sound of bare feet running rapidly toward the deck house, and then a terrible cry. We looked at each other, horrified. A high-pitched call, a kind of yodel, came from far away. We all rushed up on deck at once, jostling each other in the darkness. Everything was calm. The sails were purring happily. Near the helm, the lantern was burning brightly, illuminating the squat shape of the abandoned thermos bottle. But there was no one at the helm. Walker! Walker! We shouted frantically. Far away, from the horizon blurred by the night mists, the mysterious yodel answered us. The great, silent night swallowed up our poor walker forever. A sinister dawn, purple like the swift twilight of tropical savannas, followed that funereal night. The men, dulled by anguished insomnia, watched the choppy waves. The bowsprit frenziedly pecked at the foam of the crests. A big hole had appeared in our crossjack. Stavens opened the sail locker to replace it. Fry Tuck took out his metal palm and prepared to do a conscientious repair job. Everyone's movements were instinctive, mechanical and morose. Now and then I turned the helm and murmured to myself, What's the use? What's the use? Without having been ordered to, Turnip began climbing up the mainmast. I watched him distractedly until he reached the main yard. Then the sails hid him from sight. Suddenly we heard his frenzied shout. Hurry! Come up! There's someone on the mast! There was a fantastic sound of aerial struggle. Then a howl of agony and at the same time a whirling shape shot upward and then fell into the waves a great distance away from the ship. Jelwyn swore vehemently and began climbing up the mast, followed by Friar Tuck. Stavens and I leapt toward the only lifeboat on board. The Fleming's formidable arms were sliding it toward the water when we were rooted to the deck by astonishment and terror. Something grey, shiny and indistinct, like glass suddenly surrounded the lifeboat. The chains snapped. An unknown force tilted the schooner to port, and a wave broke over the deck and poured into the open sail locker. An instant later, the lifeboat had vanished without a trace. Gentlemen of Frytook came down from the mast. They had seen no one. Gentlemen took a rag and wiped his hands, shuddering. He had found the sail in the rigging, splattered warm blood. In a faltering voice I recited the prayer for the dead, interspersing the holy words with curses against the ocean and its mystery. It was late when Jelwyn and I went topside, having decided to spend the night at the helm together. At one moment I began to weep, and he patted me affectionately on the shoulder. I became a little calmer and lit my pipe. We had nothing to say to each other. He seemed to have fallen asleep at the helm. I stared into the darkness. I leaned over the port rail and was suddenly petrified by an unearthly sight. I straightened up, uttering a muffled exclamation. Have you seen it, Jelwyn, or are my eyes playing tricks on me? You're not mistaken, he said softly. And for the love of Christ, don't say anything about it to the others. Their minds are already close enough to madness. I had to make a great effort to go back to the rail. Jelwyn stood beside me, 
The bottom of the sea was aflame with a vast, bloody glow that spread beneath the schooner. The light slid under the keel and illuminated the sails and rigging from below. It was as though we were on a boat in the Drury Lane Theatre, lighted by an invisible row of flares. Phosphorescence, I ventured. Look, whispered Jelwyn. The water had become as transparent as glass. At an enormous depth we saw great dark masses with unreal shapes. There were manors with immense towers, gigantic domes, horribly straight streets lined with frenzied houses. We appeared to be flying over a furiously busy city at an incredible height. There seems to be movement, I said. Yes. We could see a swarming crowd of amorphous beings engaged in some sort of feverish and infernal activity. Get back! Jelman shouted, pulling me violently by the belt. One of those beings was rising toward us with astounding speed. In less than a second, its immense bulk had hidden the undersea city from us. It was as though a flood of ink had instantly spread around us. The keel received a tremendous blow. In the crimson light, we saw three enormous tentacles, three times as high as the mainmast, hideously writhing in the air. A formidable face composed of black shadows, and two eyes of liquid amber rose above the port side of the ship and gave us a terrifying look. This lasted less than two seconds. A heavy swell was headed for us broadside. Helm hard to starboard! shouted Jelwyn. The lines holding the boom snapped, and it cut through the air like an axe. The mainmast bent almost to the breaking point. Taut halyards broke with a sound like that of harp strings. The awesome vision became vague. The water was foaming. To starboard, the glow ran like a burning fringe across the high, galloping crests, then abruptly vanished. Poor Walker! Poor Tadip! said Jelwyn. The bell rang in the forecastle. The midnight watch was beginning. An uneventful morning followed. The sky was covered with thick, motionless clouds of a dirty, yellowish colour. The air was chilly. Toward noon, shining feebly through the mist, I saw a spot of light that might have been the sun. I decided to determine its position, despite Yellwyn's opinion that it would be meaningless. The sea was rough. I tried to hold the horizon, but a wave would always invade my field of vision, and the horizon would leap up into the sky. Finally I succeeded, but as I was looking for the reflection of the spot of light in the mirror of the sextant, I saw a kind of white streamer quivering in front of it at great height. Something indefinable rushed toward me. The sextant flew into the air. I received a jarring blow on the head, and then I heard shouts, sounds of struggle, and more shouts. I was not exactly unconscious. I was sprawled against the deck house. Bells were ringing endlessly in my ears. I even seemed to hear the solemn booming of Big Ben. Mingled with these pleasant sounds were clamours that were more alarming, but also further away. I was about to make an effort to stand up when I felt myself seized and lifted. I began howling and kicking with all my returning strength. Thank God, said Jelwyn. He's not dead. I managed to open my eyelids, which felt as though they were made of lead. A patch of yellow sky was cut by diagonal ropes. I saw Jelwyn staggering as though he were drunk. For the love of God, what's happened to us? I asked dolefully, for Jelwyn's face was streaming with tears. Without answering, he led me to my cabin. I saw that one of the two bunks was occupied by... A motionless mass. At this point, I completely regained my senses. I put my hands over my heart. I had just recognised Stavens' hideously swollen face. Jelwyn gave me a drink. This is the end, I heard him say. The end, I repeated stupidly, trying to understand. He put cold compresses on Stavens' face. Where's Fry Tuck? 
I asked. Jelwyn sobbed aloud. Uh, like the others, we'll never see him again. He told me in a tear-choked voice the little he knew. It had happened with incredible swiftness, like all the successive tragedies that now formed our existence. Jelwyn had been below, checking the oil cups, when he heard shouts of distress from above. He hurried topside and saw Stavens furiously struggling inside a kind of silvery bubble. A moment later, Stavens collapsed and lay still. Frytuck was gone. His metal palms and sail needles were scattered around the mainmast. Fresh blood was dripping from the starboard rail. I was lying unconscious against the deckhouse. He knew nothing more. When Stevens comes to, he'll give us more information, I said weakly. When he comes to, Jowen exclaimed bitterly, his body is nothing but a horrible bag filled with broken bones and crushed organs. Because of his Herculean constitution, he's still breathing, but for all practical purposes he's dead. Dead like the others. We let the mines salter sail as she pleased. She had little canvas spread, and she drifted sideways almost as much as she moved forward. Everything seems to show that the danger is mainly on deck, said Jelwyn, as though talking to himself. We were still in my cabin when evening came. Stephen's breathing was laboured and painful to hear. We had to keep wiping away the bloody froth that ran from his mouth. I won't sleep, I said. Neither will I, replied Jelwyn. We had closed the portholes despite the stuffy atmosphere. The ship was rolling a little. Toward two in the morning, when an invincible torpor was dulling my thoughts, and I was sinking into a half-sleep already packed with nightmares, I suddenly started. Jelwyn was wide awake. He was looking up in terror at the gleaming wooden ceiling. Someone's walking on deck, he said softly. I seized the rifle. That's useless. Let's stay where we are. <laughs> They're making themselves at home now. We heard rapid footsteps on the deck. It sounded as though a busy crowd were moving around. <laughs> I thought so, said Jolwyn. He laughed. Huh, we're gentlemen of leisure now. We have others working for us. The sounds had become more precise. The helm creaked. An arduous manoeuvre was being carried out in the headwind. They're unfurling the sails. Of course. The ship pitched heavily, then listed to starboard. The starboard tack in this wind, Jolwyn said approvingly. The monsters, brutes drunk with blood and murder, but they're sailors, the most skilled yachtsmen in England. Sailing a racer built last year wouldn't dare to sail so close to the wind. And what does it prove? No longer understanding anything, I made a gesture of discouragement. He answered his own question. It proves that we have a fixed destination, and that they want us to arrive somewhere. After reflecting for a moment, I said, it also proves that they're neither demons nor ghosts, but beings like us. Oh, that's saying a lot. I'm expressing myself badly. What I mean is that they're material beings, with only natural forces at their command. I've never doubted that, Jelwyn said calmly. Toward five in the morning, another manoeuvre was carried out, making the schooner roll heavily. Jelwyn opened a porthole. The dirty dawn was filtering through compact clouds. We cautiously ventured up on deck. It was tidy and deserted. The ship was hove to. Two calm days went by. The nocturnal manoeuvres had not been resumed, but Jelwyn pointed out that a very swift current was taking us in what should have been a northwesterly direction. 
Stevens was still breathing, but more feebly. Jelwyn had brought a portable medicine chest in his baggage, and from time to time he gave the dying man an injection. We spoke little. I think we had even stopped thinking. For my part, I was stupefied by alcohol, for I was drinking whiskey by the pint. One day, when I was drunkenly cursing the schoolmaster and promising to smash his face into a thousand pieces, I happened to mention the books he had brought on board. Jelwyn leapt forward and shook me vigorously. Careful! I'm the captain, I said gently. To hell with captains like you! What did you say? Books? Yes. In his cabin. There's a trunk. Full of them. I saw them myself. They're written in Latin. I don't know that pharmacist's jargon. Well, I know it. Why didn't you tell me about those books? What difference would it have made? I muttered thickly. Anyway, I'm the captain. You, you ought to respect me. You damn drunk, he said angrily, going off toward the schoolmaster's cabin. I heard him step inside and close the door behind him. The inert and pitiful Stevens was my companion during the hours of drinking that followed. Um, the captain of this ship, I mumbled, and I'll, I'll complain to the authorities. He called me a, a damn drunk. I'm the master after God on my ship. Isn't that right, Stevens? You're a witness. He insulted me, basely. I'll put him in irons. <laughs> then I slept a little. When Jelwyn came in to swallow a hasty meal of hardtack and corned beef, his cheeks were flushed and his eyes were glittering. Mr. Ballister... He said, did the schoolmaster ever tell you about a crystal object? A box, perhaps? He didn't confide in me, I grunted, still remembering his rudeness. Ah, if only I'd had those books before all these things began happening. Have you found anything? I asked. I'm getting a few glimmers. The path is opening up. It's probably senseless, but in any case it's amazing. More amazing than you can possibly imagine. He was terribly excited. I was unable to get anything more out of him. He hurried back to the schoolmaster's cabin when I left him alone. I did not see him again until the beginning of evening, and then only for a few minutes. He came in to fill a kerosene lamp and did not say a word. I slept until late the next morning. As soon as I woke up, I went to the schoolmaster's cabin. Jelwyn was not there. Seized with painful anxiety, I called him. There was no answer. I ran all over the ship, shouting his name, even forgetting prudence to the point of going up on deck. Finally, I threw myself on the floor, weeping and invoking the name of God. I was alone on board the accursed schooner, alone with the dying Stevens. Alone. Horribly alone. It was not until noon that I went back to the schoolmaster's cabin. My attention was immediately caught by a sheet of paper pinned to the wall. I read these words in Jelwyn's handwriting. Mr. Ballister, I am going to the top of the mainmast. I must see something. Perhaps I shall never return. If so, forgive me for my death, which will leave you all alone, because Stevens is doomed, as you know. But quickly do what I tell you. Burn all these books. Do it on the stern, far from the mainmast. And do not go near the edge of the ship. I think an effort will be made to prevent you from burning the books. Everything inclines me to believe it. But burn them. Burn them quickly. Even at the risk of setting fire to the ship. Will it save you? I dare not hope so. Perhaps Providence will give you a chance. May God have mercy on you, Mr. Ballister and on all of us. Duke.
Here appears a name that we shall not reveal, in order not to rekindle the sorrow of a great and noble reigning family. Jelwyn bore a heavy weight of guilt, but his death brilliantly redeemed him. When I returned to my cabin, shaken by that extraordinary farewell, and cursing the shameful drunkenness that had probably prevented my valiant companion from awakening me, I no longer heard Stephen's irregular breathing. I leaned over his poor, contorted face. He too was gone. I took two cans of gasoline from the little engine room, and, moved by some sort of providential instinct, I started the engine and turned it up to full speed. I went back to the helm, piled the books on the deck, and poured gasoline on them. A high, pale flame arose. At that moment there was a cry from the sea, and I heard someone call my name, and I too cried out, in surprise and fear. In the wake of the mine's salter, a hundred feet back, swam the schoolmaster. The flames crackled. The books were rapidly being transformed into ashes. The infernal swimmer shouted curses and supplications. Ballister, I'll make you rich, richer than all men on earth put together. I'll make you die, you imbecile, in horrible tortures that are unknown on your accursed planet. I'll make you king, Barrister, king of a formidable kingdom. Ah, you swine. Hell would be sweeter to you than what I have in store for you. He swam desperately, but made little progress in overtaking the ship. Suddenly the schooner made a few strange movements and was shaken by dull blows. I saw the water rising toward me. The ship was being pulled toward the bottom of the sea. Barrister, listen to me howled the schoolmaster. He was quickly drawing closer. His face was horribly impassive, but his eyes were burning with unbearable brightness. Then, in the middle of a mass of hot ashes, I saw a piece of parchment curl up and reveal a sparkling object. I remembered Jelwyn's words. The specially constructed book had been hiding the crystal box he had mentioned to me. A crystal box! I exclaimed. The schoolmaster heard me. He shrieked like a madman, and I saw an incredible sight. He stood on the water, with his hands outstretched like threatening claws. It's knowledge! The greatest knowledge of all that you are about to destroy, you damn fool! He roared. Shrill yodels were now coming toward me from all points of the horizon. The first waves broke over the deck. I leapt into the flames and smashed the crystal box with my heel. I had a feeling of collapse and terrible nausea. Sky and water blended in a flashing chaos. An immense clamour shook the air. I began a frightful fall into darkness. And here I am. I've told you everything now. I woke up on your ship. I'm going to die. Have I been dreaming? I wish I could believe it. But I'm going to die among men. On my own earth. Oh, how happy I am. It was Briggs, the cabin boy of the North Caper, who had first sighted Ballister. The boy had just stolen an apple from the galley and was about to eat it, huddled among some coils of cable when he saw Ballister, swimming sluggishly a few yards from the ship. Briggs began shouting at the top of his lungs, for he saw that the swimmer was about to be drawn into the wash of the propeller. Ballister was pulled out of the water. He was unconscious. His swimming movements had been automatic as sometimes happens with very strong swimmers. There was no ship in sight, and no trace of wreckage on the water. The cabin boy said that he had seen a ship as transparent as glass, those are his own words, rise up off the port beam, then sink below the surface. This earned him a slap from Captain Corman to teach him not to tell such wild stories. We managed to pour a little whiskey down Ballister's throat, 
Rose, the engineer, gave him his bunk, and we covered him warmly. He soon passed from unconsciousness into deep, feverish sleep. We were waiting with curiosity for him to awaken, when a terrible incident took place. This is now being told by John Copeland, first mate of the North Cape. It was I, who with seamen jolks, saw the mystery and terror that came out of the night. The last bearing taken during the day had located the North Caper at longitude 22 degrees west and latitude 60 degrees north. I took the helm myself, having decided to spend the night on deck, because the night before we had seen long ice flows glittering in the moonlight on the northwest horizon. Jolks hung up the running lights, and since he had a violent toothache that was made worse by the warmth of the forecastle, he came to smoke his pipe beside me. I was glad, because a lonely watch can be terribly monotonous when it lasts all night. I must tell you that while the North Caper is a good, sturdy ship, she is not a trawler of the latest model, even though she has been equipped with radio. The spirit of fifty years ago still weighs down on her, leaving her with sails that supplement the limited power of her steam engine. She does not have the tall, enclosed, ungainly cabin that is perched in the middle of the deck on most modern trawlers like a ludicrous little cottage. Her helm is still on the stern, facing the sea, the wind, and the spray. I am giving you this description so that you will know that we witness the incomprehensible scene not from a glassed-in observation post, but from the deck itself. Without this explanation, my story would not seem believable to those familiar with the design of steam trawlers. There was no moonlight, because the sky was too overcast. Only the diffused glow of the clouds and the phosphorescence of the wave crests made it possible to see anything. It was somewhere around ten o'clock. The men were sunk deep in their first sleep. Jolks, absorbed in his toothache, was softly moaning and swearing. The binnacle light made his tense face stand out from the surrounding darkness. Suddenly I saw his grimace of pain change to an expression of astonishment, and then of genuine terror. His pipe fell from his open mouth. This struck me as so comical that I made a mocking remark to him. His only reply was to point to the starboard light. My pipe joined his when I saw what he was pointing to. Clutching the shrouds a few inches below the light, two wet hands were emerging from the darkness. Suddenly the hands let go, and a dark form leapt onto the deck. Jolks quickly stepped aside, and the binnacle light shone on the intruder's face. To our indescribable amazement, we saw a kind of clergyman wearing a black tailcoat and streaming with seawater. He had a small head with eyes like glowing coals that were staring straight at us. Jolks made a move to take out his fishing knife, but he did not have time. The apparition leapt on him and knocked him down. At the same time, the binnacle light was shattered. A few moments later, there was a shrill cry from the forecastle, where the cabin boy had been sitting up with Ballister. He's killing him! Help! Ever since I had had to stop some serious brawls among members of the crew, I had made it a habit to carry my revolver at night. It was a powerful weapon, and I shot well with it. I cocked it. The ship was filled with a confused clamour. A short time after this series of events, a gust of wind ripped a gash in the clouds, and a beam of moonlight followed the ship like a spotlight. I could already hear the captain swearing above Briggs's cry of alarm when to my right I heard soft footsteps, and saw the clergyman leap over the side and into the water. I saw his small head rise on the crest of a wave. I calmly aimed at it and fired. He uttered a strange howl as the wave carried him toward the side of the ship. Jonks appeared beside me. Although he was still a little dazed, he was wielding a grappling iron. The body was now floating alongside the ship, bumping against it. The grappling iron bit into the clothes and pulled up its prey with surprising ease. Jonks dropped a shapeless wet bundle on the deck, saying that it felt as light as a feather. Captain Corman came out of the forecastle, holding a lighted lantern. Someone tried to kill our shipwreck victim, he said. We've got the bandit, I said. 
He came out of the sea. You're crazy, Copeland. Uh, look at him, Captain. I shot him, man. We leaned over the pitiful remains, but we immediately straightened up again, shouting like madmen. The clothes were empty. Two artificial hands and a wax head were attached to them. My bullet had gone through the wig and broken the nose. You already know Ballister's story. He told it to us when he woke up toward the end of that infernal night. He spoke serenely with a kind of happiness. We took devoted care of him. There were two holes in his left shoulder, as though he had been stabbed twice. But we would have saved him if we had been able to stop his bleeding because no essential organs had been damaged. After having talked so much, he lapsed into a coma. When he came out of it later, he asked how he had been injured. Briggs was the only one with him at the time. Glad to have a chance to make himself interesting, he replied that in the middle of the night he had seen a dark shape rush into the forecastle and strike Ballister. He then told him about the shot and showed him the grotesque remains. At this sight, Ballister cried out in terror. The schoolmaster! He fell into a painful fever and did not regain consciousness until six days later in the maritime hospital in Galway, where he kissed the image of Christ and died. The tragic Malikim was taken to Reverend Lehman's, a worthy ecclesiastic who has been all over the world and knows many of the secrets of savage lands and the sea. He examined it for a long time. What can have been inside it? asked Archie Raines. There surely was something in it. It was alive. Yes, it was alive, all right, I can tell you that, grumbled Jolks, rubbing his red, swollen neck. Reverend Lehman sniffed the thing like a dog, then cast it aside with disgust. I thought so, he said, and we also sniffed it. It smells of formic acid, I said, and phosphorus. Added Rains. Captain Corman reflected for a moment, then his lips quivered a little when he said, It smells like an octopus. Lehmans stared at him. On the last day of creation, he said, It is from the sea that God will cause the blasphemous beast to appear. Let us not try to anticipate destiny with impious inquiries. But, began Rains, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Before the holy word, we bowed our heads and gave up trying to understand. Today's story was The Mind's Psalter by Jean Ray. It was read by Jasper Lestrange. I hope you enjoyed it, and until next time, sweet dreams. <laughs>